10 years ago, I would find one ad that would work on Facebook and I'd spend $3 million against it. And it would just run for six months or a year. Yeah. And now a great ad spending two to 10,000 a day, you're gonna burn out in a week most yeah. of the time. It just doesn't last. Hey guys, this video is sponsored by Ringba, the number one call tracking platform. If you haven't already, make sure to grab your copy of the Paper Call Revolution, which you can find on the Amazon. All right, everyone, I have a very special guest, one of the OGs from the affiliate marketing space, the founder and CEO of A4D, Jason Akatif. Thank you so much for joining me, my Yeah, friends. thanks for having me, John. This so great. tell everyone how you got into this space and when you first got into affiliate marketing. Uh, I've been in affiliate marketing for over 20 years now. Started in 2003. Uh, the landscape was very different. There was no Facebook. Google search ads had just come out. Uh, Google display, they were just talking about, was pre canned spam. So you could send email to whatever you want and there was no rules. It was just a very different landscape. There's no it, really any kind of communities for the most part, other than the way I got into space. It, like I was always interested in the internet from uh, growing up in the Bay Area. And uh, I stumbled across an ebook, and it came with an ebook, a forum, and a package of Perl scripts. And it was called Search Engine Cloaker. And the book was whatever, and the scripts were whatever. But the community in the forum, there were people in there making real money, and that really inspired me to want to go deeper into this business. Keep in mind, there was no affiliate summit, there was no leads gone, there was nothing, right? Like there are no trade shows or anything that was affiliate, other than maybe adult, but I wasn't in the adult space. And so the, all you had was these online communities. And so did some black hat SEO stuff, which is basically means reverse engineering the algorithms of Google and Yahoo. It's like keyword to, stuffing on the Yeah, computers. or link, a lot of link spam or whatever way back when. And, um, you know, that, that group of people on the forum, we all supported each other and traded information and stuff like that. And some of those people I'm still friends with to this day. Uh, the true pioneers of affiliate marketing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but it, you know, people ask often ask me like, what makes you successful in this business? And you know, a lot of it is just the community, right? And that's where that started for me, right? It was on forums. Uh, I was on that forum, then a couple of other forums, and I became a moderator on Wicked Fire, which was like a hundred thousand person affiliate forum. Again, all pre Facebook. So, so if we did searches of those four, I don't know if they're still around. Yeah, you can yeah, see yeah. like posts from you back in the day. Yeah, what what is CPC? Right, like what it? Uh, how, what is a keyword, or how do you decide on keywords? Right, like this super basic earliest of questions, and uh, Wicked Fire particularly, like it was uh, it was quite a shit show, right? Like it was just a troll fest, <laughs> and anybody that asked any questions on there, you know, they they would just get hammered in every direction, but. You know, I always tried to have a brand of supporting and, and helping other people uh, become better, right? Like I'm an entrepreneur at heart. Like I want to see everybody around me succeed and learn and grow and make connections. And so like I was, I was always tried to be the voice of reason why everybody else was the, the trolls on that forum, you know? And then that led me to, uh, I used to do a lot with uh, what I called project partners. And Project Partners was like, I did a 50-50 with like seven different people, all separate from one another. And then that got a lot to manage and that's what made me, yeah, you know, wanted to get an affiliate network platform. Again, totally different space, there was one. Right, now you got all these call tracking platforms, you got uh, regular tracking platforms, you got all this stuff, pixels and yeah. none of that existed, right? It was uh, one, one, platform called direct track uh it was like twenty thousand dollars a month to run it and uh but you know it was like oh let's consolidate all this together and you know from years of helping people on forums you know that about two thousand media buyers signed up with us in one day and all of a sudden i was in the network business which i never really intended to be it was more just a consolidation platform to work with my partner so uh were you still buying media yourself at that time, or 
Uh, I bought media from 08 to 2011, realistically. Before 08, I was doing Black Hat SEO stuff. And I still buy media sometimes, right? I still get into platforms, and I like to keep my skills at least moderately relevant. Um, I still very much keep really close tabs on changes to the platforms, how the algorithms are working. Uh, I think you know, we run a team of media buyers and a team of creatives in a company, and there's so much in the trenches all the time. So, you know, I'm always trying to get information from my network and other places on what's working and bring it back to them. Because so, so often, whenever you're just turning the crank every day, you know, you lose sight of some of that stuff and how the algorithms are changing and how creative it changes or what what you're doing there. So, uh, but I still buy sometimes. Probably, I don't know. Uh, last thing I bought at scale was like a hundred thousand a month on YouTube uh, for e-commerce maybe two years ago. Yeah, and then I just was uh, I bought quite a bit on Twitter. Not uh, yeah, fifty thousand total, but for Twitter that's hard, <laughs> um, at least for me. Uh, and that was probably six months ago. So, like, I'll go tweak with... I want to go play with a news break platform that's out and start doing some stuff on there and just see how it works. Yeah. Kind of prove it up and then give it to the team to run with. What What's... Uh, so, you have an interesting perspective of obviously seeing, like, affiliate traffic side, but then also a really successful internal side. What are, what are the different patterns or, like, insights you get from the affiliate versus the internal? Internal is a machine. It's all about like throughput, systems, testing. They're, they're not quite as hacky, right? And there's a certain degree of fear as a media buyer, right? You're making 80 or 1,000 a year, 100,000 a year, whatever the number is. And you're spending 10,000 a day or 20,000 a day Right, there's an inherent challenge or struggle between that. It's like a men- mindset almost. Mental yeah. thing. That's not to say that those people couldn't spend a lot more. They're good media buyers. But I think there's some level of inherent fear and risk taking in media buying. And you know, I think us as a company, we're like, hey, don't lose too much money, right? Like that's inherent. Um, so I think you want, as your media buyers, you want them to be kind of competitive risk takers, but you don't want them to really be gamblers. And when I look at an affiliate as well, affiliates typically bucket into a handful of things that make them amazing. You've got your person that like, there's nothing about development and it's terrible with numbers, but they're amazing with creative. And it, it, you ask them, like, how do you buy? They're just like, I don't know. I just set it up on a the Chad, CB, the CBO. Chad yeah. yeah, the Chad method. I set it up on a CBO. I make some badass creatives. I look at some CTRs. And if it's good, I go all in, right? And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. You know, I know some publishers that are like, you know, they're so far along in their career, single guys that are like, I don't know, I'm going to spend 20000 on this placement buy t- for one day. I think it's going to work, right? And that <laughs> takes a certain degree, right? So, like, in this, in this game, too, like, you've got this statistical significance thing, right? So it's like, oh, I spent this amount of money. It didn't work. I'm going to pull back. But like, if you look at it from a truly mathematical, statistical analysis standpoint, maybe you need to spend 10 times as much money because you're still within the tolerances of statistical significance to to have it way under full form. Yeah. Right. And that's, you know, we do a lot in tort and leads in tort are 100 to $500, you know. And so realistically to test something, you probably need to spend $20,000 just to test. To really test. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's like a creative and an audience, right? And so you can get really knee-jerky in that stuff. So, so number one, you've got that great creative person. Then, and this, these people exist less and less with AI, 
But then you've got that hacker. And the hacker is really good at figuring out bidding strategies and the algorithms. You know, sometimes those hackery people are great at finding other niche unknown traffic sources that are super profitable for them. Uh, but they're, they're very hackery in their mindset. Back in the olden days, you know, it was things like, hey, there was a kind of, a, I don't even know if it still exists, but like on Taboola, like if you bid $30 a click at 12 o'clock in the morning, right, that would put you in first place in the yeah, auction. Yeah, little gaps in that and then you And then you pull your bid down, right, and then you make it back to the normal, but you'd be at spot one in an auction for the day, right? Like all yeah. kinds of like nuanced hacks to make things work. And a lot of times, like I was just talking with uh, Brooks from uh, Pinktree.com the other day, uh, we, were, we were talking about like, anybody can get a handful of debt buyers on the back end of a debt offer and stand up a debt offer. Like yeah. it, it's, it's a fairly trivial thing at this point, right? Like anybody can do it, but you're not gonna make money, right? It's all those kind of nuanced data monetization stuff, yep. uh, how you ask the questions on the page, what order you ask the questions on the page, you put a phone number on the page or not, right? Like all, there's thousands and thousands of nuanced hacky things that, and it's, it's typically lots of testing, but then it's like, ah, this, these three things is what made that whole deal work, right? And so you got these like hacker-minded people that are constantly testing and tinkering and tweaking. Um, and then you've got like a, 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 the other group of people is just really good pattern recognition analyst type people where, you know, they might come in and they'd look at all of my media buyers running and they'd find some pattern and then they'd go and they implement that pattern and it would just scale, right? Um, I've seen these people be extremely successful and very rarely does a creative person a hacker or right so the more that you can build up those different skills that cross over or find a partner that you know complements those skills the higher probability that's you're, the one that, you're gonna that find usually success. wins big yeah. it's going to be the the high almost like a hybrid of right both. somebody that's amazing at creative and then you got this hacker that's figuring out the algorithms and understanding you know how to capitalize because it's like maybe you make if you if you're great at creative maybe you make 20% margin or 15% margin. But if you p marry that with like a really good buyer that like is finding nuances in the data, maybe that number is 40%, yeah. right? And you pair those two or 60% if you pair those two together. And then I guess there's a, there's a fourth and this one can kind of go across them all. Like who's networked in the note most and has the most uh, contacts and relationships? Because there's everybody in this room knows something, right? And then yeah. if it's their secret sauce, do they want to share it with you? It's not a conversation, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, have, what have you ever done for them? Yep. Right? Like, it's part of my thought process and methodology of this industry. It's like, did I just help everybody all the time and I give away as much help and information as I possibly can? Um, because you and, and you never know how it's going to come back, and it's not like oh tit for tat or it's just like putting good out there with people you feel you can trust or aren't going to go put it all over the internet and tell every single person yep. they run into, so you lose your competitive advantage. And it's you, you build up this network of hey all hey I found out this thing I found out this thing right and and all of a sudden when you find a good group of people that are good at figuring that stuff out or they have good relations. You, there's almost like this information trade that happens in the business. It's like another lever applied on top, right? And you could be weaker in maybe the creative department yeah. or the data department, but have that relationship advantage and insight and connections. And yeah, I guess one other piece in there is just like market research. Like I probably still spend for the last 20 years looking at ads a half an hour a day. I don't know why, I just enjoy it, right? I'm like <laughs> looking at an ad, trying to understand how it's performing, trying to understand the landing page, what is the user journey? If I were to like model this out, what do I think that analytics and KPIs are for that user journey? So I think all those things kind of play together and then the more you become better at each of them, like the more you can be successful.
out of all those archetypes, where, where would you say is your strongest and then is your weakest? Mm, I mean, I'm de- like on the networking side, I'm, I'm the guy that goes and gets the information for the team, right? Like, and we use uh, extraordinarily strong on the research side. Like, I'm always doing analysis. I, I watch MSN homepage for the last 20 years, see what's running, see how it's running, right? All that kind of stuff. And then on the actual buying side, um, probably the more of that kind of hackery stuff, which, you know, I don't, again, why I went and figured out Twitter, because you could still do some of that stuff in Twitter where, like, Facebook and Google, like, they're just not there. I mean, search kind of, but even that, they're consolidating down. Yeah. I mean, you want to run YouTube shorts. It's just like, you've got, you've got to make a great ad and run broad and, like, you do all the tweaks you want. And if your ad sucks, you will not make matter. money. It's your not ad be. has to be a banger in order for you to make YouTube work. Period. Right? And so there's no, like, hacking stuff to do. Where, where Twitter there still is and some other smaller channels there is. Uh, and then Facebook is, like, almost everything we run is broad now. I mean, yeah. we'll layer on a lookalike, but maybe three to five years ago, like, lookalikes were a home run. If you had a data set, yep. great people... Like you, you were like hammering, <laughs> and then now since iOS fourteen point five, like it works, but like not the same. Yeah, I mean it works at the same level as interests, and I think a lot of I think a lot of those platforms now are really creative driven. Yep. You know, how are you looking at first party events in platform? rather than out of platform. So how are you getting on the right audience in platform via your creative? And also it depends on, you know, what you're running. In the olden days, you know, we ran a lot of just clickbait type ads, right? Just get cheap to, clicks as cheap as you can yep. and then put them into some sort of a funnel and it starts pruning them out. And at least for what we do on the tort side, it is fairly micro niche. Uh, people, there's very small like qualifying audiences for it. You know, we we're trying to get on the right audience right on the front end. So, you know, I think there is a lot of opportunity in things that maybe only worked on search in the past, but will work on Facebook now. But you do have to do it through creative. What first got you in the tort? I didn't know really anything about tort for the first two to three years we were in it. Uh, a guy named Matt Stansel was running the business for me, and I knew they were working on this thing called tort, but I really, I really didn't know anything about it. And then it started to be a large enough part of the business that I started going, what is this? And went to some trade shows and stuff. Um, there was a guy named Mike, Michael Orell. So Michael Orell... Uh, when I hired him a long time ago, he, w- he was a manager of the two top uh, T-Mobile stores in the U.S. And I brought him in, and his cousin was, you know, friends with me and got him into the business, worked with me a couple of years, left, and, and started his own fil- affiliate network. And he got pretty heavily into tort outside of A4D. We brought him back into A4D, and he's like, you guys should do tort. And off, off we went into the tort space. Uh, as with... As with most things, it, it has lots of complexity and complication. Yes. It's, it's, not, it's not as cut and dry as like ACA or her Medicare or anything like that, right? You're looking, you're looking for a needle in a haystack of needles. Yep. You know? That pays very well. It pays very, very well. Um, but it's a different kind of marketing, right? You're like, I can't run an ad that's clickbaity because like, 99% of people are not going to be the right people. Yep. It's easier to get those people to self-identify on platform and then through engagement, teach the platform who the audience you want is, right? Uh, as we look at creatives, you know, it's engagement is like the one key indicator, much more so than CPA for us, right? We're looking at... Basically, however long somebody engages with your content, the longer they engage with it, the higher probability they have to convert. 
So that's what you focus on with, yeah. with your tour campaigns. All engagement, right? Like, and then part of that is getting people to self-select out. So like on YouTube, you've got that first five second skip. Yep. Right, so if you're you know, camera guy, you're selling camera equipment, first thing you wanna do is call out that user in that first five seconds. Are you a camera guy like me? Do you hate this problem that you deal with with your equipment all the time? Well, you know, here's a solution, right? And, yep. and if, if you're not a camera guy or camera girl, just, right, you're just gonna skip, which is what you want to happen. You don't want to actually- this. It's very direct. Right. And, and in the olden days, it was the opposite, right? You just wanted to get everybody to watch your stuff as much as possible, or now you want the right people to watch your stuff and the other people to not. And especially, again, back since iOS 14.5, where the uh, lookalikes and offline conversion stuff is not nearly as impactful, the creative and events and engagement on platform is much more impactful from what we see. What are some of the challenges you see for, let's say, an affiliate coming into the space today versus 10 years ago? Um, I think a lot of the people that came to the space 10 years ago were more technical and more of those kind of like hacky problem solvers. Uh, it was easier to find margin. And... Was that because of the barrier of entry of the skill set kept yeah, a lot of people out? Yeah, I mean, all, all these things layer on, right? Like the AI, like it takes away competitive advantages. If we go back to like advertorials, it really didn't exist online pre-2010. You know, we ran advertorials for almost five years and no agency ran an advertorial. And the cycle of understanding and progress, it just continually gets compressed, 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 right? And so where you might figure something out like, oh, advertorials work well and have five years to milk that, then it was three years, then it was two years. Now it might be a month. It's like attention spans. It's just everything moves e fast. Everything. Well, people are more educated. You know, it was like, keep in mind, like 10 years ago, an agency, it was all about branding and Coca-Cola and TV, right? And so they're like, what is this kind of like hacky advertorial thing, right? Or we look at UGC now and all the big brands are doing it. But like in the beginning, they're like, oh, we only want professional actors that represent our brand well. And it took them a long time to, to figure these things out. But, you know, as they figured those things out, they've become more progressive into whatever else is evolving. And so that just like narrows your window of time on stuff uh, to, to have those competitive advantage of things. Um, the other thing I think is, especially on channels like Facebook and YouTube, there's such a demand for creative. Well, 10 years ago, I would find one ad that would work on Facebook and I'd spend $3 million against it. And it would just run for six months or a year. Yeah. And now a great ad spending two, th uh, two to 10,000 a day, it's gonna burn out in a week most yeah. of the time. It just doesn't last. So you have to have this creative production engine. I saw this, I follow this girl, works at like a agency. They spend about 100 million a year on D to C, uh, like Shopify store brands, and and you know her whole thing is like we have brands come to us all the time, and they're like, I try and scale, but my ROAS, my return on ad spend goes down. And she's like, How many ads are you making? And they're like, Three a week. And they're like, How much do you want? What number do you want to be at for your company? Well, we want to be at two million a month in revenue through this channel. And it's like, Cool, you're going to need seventy five creatives a week in order to build that and sustain that. And that's unique, not variations of one. Yeah, and sometimes variations, yeah. like a blend, probably 30% totally new, you know, images mixed with video. Yeah, everything. Like everything blended together, but she, you know, she's just like, you just need this creative throughput 
And then you got to have the stomach and, and you got to, you know, as you build up this creative throughput, uh, you've got to have enough running in order to test all that creative as well. Because you can't just take 75 creatives and throw it in next week. Yeah. You're going to lose a ton of money. So you've got to have, you got to build up. But like, as you're building up, you've just got to build more and more and more and more creative. And... You know, as an affiliate, like I'm on photo, I'm in Photoshop making three ads a week that I think are going to be bangers, and you know, one of them hits, and you know, I got a payday, and it's not real anymore. Yeah. You know, and and so I, th- I think that's gotten much much harder. That if I had to, you know, speak directly to it. But the trade off has been ease of access, AI technology. A talent you can source creators from in this example, right? Yeah, I mean, there, the the infrastructure and the broadness of the industry has just gotten much wider, right? It's like if you if you go back twenty years ago, there were much less. There were no trade shows. There were way less less merchants. There was no tracking platforms. On my blog, like I don't know, fifteen years ago, I wrote like what was the original tracker in PHP because I, w- I couldn't track anything. Yeah. And then they took that uh, and they, they made tracking 202 kind of out of that concept and then that spawned volume and whatever else. And, you know, but none of that stuff existed. So like to write a tracking platform in PHP, like you had a competitive advantage nobody else had access to, right? Where now you got a hundred tracking platforms in this room. Yeah. And, and there's no competitive, and, and their biggest motivation is to actually put more people on their platform to create more competition for the people that are doing the work. So you're like, you're, you're ultimately cannibalizing yourself by using those platforms, but the ease of use is there, right? It's like this. It's a trade-off. Tr- crazy trade-off. Uh, this is the nature of the industry in some way too, though, right? It is. It is. Uh, so, you know what, and, and this has always happened in the affiliate world. You know, we don't play in this world anymore. You know, back in 2010, we were involved with a federal trade commission lawsuit. So we run really compliant and stuff like that. But what ends up happening now, because you can't get competitive advantages the other way, you know, you got 20 year old kids that will run any kind of ad and make any make type box. of claim. Yeah. Like, it's always been that way to a certain degree, but now, I mean, there's people doing $20 million a year running super uncompliant stuff out there. You know, we don't touch any of it. I see it running all the time. Yeah, same. And that's the only way they can find a competitive advantage, right? Doing uncompliant shit. So it's definitely gotten harder in that sense, in my opinion. So if you had to start over today as an affiliate, uh-huh. What would you do to set yourself up, not just to make money today, but to make money in three years from now? Copywriting. And like if I, if I had to say what one great skill set or who would I partner with, really great copywriters. Because to me, that's the, uh, like, how do you run something that has the same impact as an uncompliant ad, but do it compliantly, right? Like that's the magic of a great copywriter. And to me, that's probably one of the largest skill set differentiators that I see in the space, right? That or... I mean, the other thing is like capturing your own data, monetizing your own data, uh, squeezing every dollar you can out of stuff. I think as things get harder, you need to find other revenue in places maybe you didn't care about it before. Um, I'm seeing a lot of big affiliates doing that. Yeah, That's been the majority of the, the select few that are at the highest level that I personally know in this room. Yeah, They're finding ways to, to compliantly yeah. monetize data. Well, I mean, if they're making 20% more than you are, like they're gonna win. Always, every time. So, you know, these things are hard. (laughs) Because, again, it's not like you're in your basement and making some Photoshop ads and throwing them up on Facebook. It just, it's just not that way anymore. 
and the, the big traffic sources like your Yahoo's or your Taboola's or, you know, these places were unbastardized and unoptimized uh, for many years, yeah. right? And now you've got like search arm guys running on Taboola that have technology that are spending a half a million a day beating <laughs> like, you know, it's just the level of what it takes to compete on those platforms. It's gotten extraordinarily hard. What are some um, other ways you could see someone starting out find or create competitive advantages? I mean, you know, it depends depends on budgets and money, but like if I don't have a lot of money, I'm probably looking for less used traffic sources like Twitter. Right? Like not many people are on Twitter. They have a decent amount of traffic. You can buy there pretty easily as far as like ad approval process and dealing with all that. They don't take down your accounts. Yep. Like just ease of buying. Like if, if I was I was able to get up, get live, get conversions happening in like 24 hours. And granted, I know how to do this stuff. Yeah. But I think for somebody to make that a success on Facebook is way harder at this stage. Yep. Um, what about other markets? Like taking the concept of... Outside the U.S.? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we... Uh, I did that back in 2012 with, with Gary McNelly. Um, like we took... There was a bunch of supplement stuff running in the U.S. And we took the same model and took it to Brazil. And here we were running at... 30% margins. Brazil, we were running at 300% margins. <laughs> and I think for e-commerce, it's easier. You know, there's a lot of infrastructure and stuff to handle that at, in Leeds. Yeah. It's depending actually on, very depending hard. On the country. Yeah. yeah. Leeds is very hard. We have vendors in UK. But then you've got to deal with, like, GDPR laws and just the complexity of it all. Um the, you know, if somebody's interested in international markets, I think the affiliate world shows are phenomenal, right? Like I was just speaking in Dubai, there's 6,000 attendees from all over the world. So, you know, the UAE and all those markets are, are available. I, and I, I do think there's good opportunity there. Like com the U.S. is just so competitive, yeah. right? It's like... That's also the biggest. Biggest, the right? Best, and best what's economies. interesting is you go to Dubai... 50% of those people are running in the U.S., right? Because we got 300 million people. We got, you know, per capita is one of the highest in the world. So we all speak one language. Yep. Right? You go to Europe, you got all it's different jurisdictions, all different laws, all different languages. And then it's like, oh, I figured out Italy. Well, it's a tiny little market. Like, you, you, like yes, if you're a small guy and, and you want to do... 500 bucks a day or a thousand a day. Sure. That's interesting. But like for me, unless I can do a million a month in something, like it's not even at all interesting. I won't even look at it at this point. Yeah. Right. Cause it's just a distraction. So it's the same amount of work to figure out a million a month thing out that it does to do a 50,000 a month thing. Right. Like, yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean all that to say, I think international markets are great. They're just, they have complexity on complexity, right? You might be getting cheaper traffic. But it's on a net positive and, yeah, and go, scale. Yeah, go try and find a life insurance offer in Hungary, right? Like, <laughs> might exist. Or you might have to make it, which creates all so yeah. much more complexity. And you're starting a company. Like. Right. <laughs> and there's, there is people over there that, uh, you know, are good at that stuff, right? They run in the U.S. market. They run in those markets as well. Um, I think the laws and compliance in other countries are more relaxed. So maybe something that's uncompliant here is compliant in some other country. Um, I don't know the laws as a U.S. citizen, what laws you need to adhere to. So I'm no you know, attorney that can speak to that. Yeah. So if anybody's going to take U.S. stuff that's uncompliant and run it somebody or else. We should get some legal. <laughs> legal. Uh, Don't listen to this video. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what are you most excited about in, in the affiliate space today? Uh, I, you know, I see opportunities 
bubbling up. But you know, from a from a offer type standpoint, I really think subscription based, the higher LTV stuff is where I see people having a lot of success. You know, and whether that's a SaaS product or uh, something like a Rise Coffee, Mushroom Coffee, or, you know, whatever, right? Any, any kind of subscription-based consumable that people like. Typically higher dollar, you know, I don't like your 7 or $9 toothpaste. Yeah. You know, what can you sell for 60 bucks on a subscription? That stuff's super interesting. And, and maybe you can figure out how to deliver a great product, have a 15 to... 24 months retention on that, then you can pay $300 to acquire a customer, and then you could really win in the auction based marketplace. And sell and sell, do an exit at some point, maybe with that. That, that as well. Uh, I had a brand we built called Boundary, grew it to 40 million. It was uh, emergency light bulbs and various lighting products. It was re- no subscription revenue. Really hard to get reorders. It, like people bought the light bulbs one time, then uh, you try and sell them other stuff, and we did, but like that was like twenty percent. And you know, I think you need a consistent like thirty to fifty percent if somebody's rebuying the product, or you know, or if it's single, if they're only buying it one time, then. Then you wind up doing product line expansion to try and sell them more stuff. But ultimately, if you do product line expansion, you have a lot more inventory. And once you have a lot more inventory, it sucks a lot more cash, right? And so I I think the subscription-based stuff is interesting. Um, So would you predict that we'll see more affiliates cut their teeth in this space to learn the acquisition game and then move into actually launching their own offers and companies Outside of the space. I think they always do. Like Naturally. Affiliates have one of three paths. Uh, number one, they're like, I just like being an affiliate. I make, you know, half a million a year or a million a year as an affiliate. I don't have any employees. I just do my thing, right? I know a handful of those guys. They work yeah. with us for years. Then you got the, I'm going to create a service for the industry, right? Track drive. Ring bug, right? Adam was a affiliate, right? The call gurus, I'm sure they were affiliates, right? It's like, oh, I'm gonna build a company. And I did the same thing, right? Yeah. Started as affiliate. And so they do that. Or the other thing that they do is they go build an offer or products. Now with all this acquisition knowledge, they go figure out how to do that. And um, you know, or or they wind up in some corporate marketing job, which I I actually know a lot that do that as well, yeah. right? And some of the some of the skill sets and knowledge that you gain as an affiliate, right? Uh, in corporate America, like people just don't have this. So I often see people that came through the affiliate world uh, accelerate into companies. So like again, back to the mass towards space, head of marketing for a handful of businesses in the market fit. It all came through the affiliate world right because they just under they understand all the things from analytics to creatives and how it works together and how to drive a real customer versus this uh branding you know, BS. branding yeah. stuff <laughs> and so but it just depends on what somebody wants their their journey to be right and different things for different people i used to always think you know as a entrepreneur i used to think well everybody should be like me and I think I'm much more now that I'm old I'm like what do you want your life to look like what is amazing for you and it's like yeah building a software company is very hard right like developers and handling all that and then bringing on customers and dealing with customers and then the support around it and I guess it's a whole different kind of hard Um, but like once you get it going it's great but running media and trying to make offers work is another kind of hard, right? Like you're basically gambling every single day. (laughs) You're like, let's go. New ads. These are going to crush, right? And uh, and sometimes they do. Most of the time they they don't. don't. (laughs) You're like, damn it. I thought I had that one right. 
Yeah, the longer you're in this business, the more you, the more you realize, like, nah, I don't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> I just make shit and put it up. And sometimes it works. Sometimes it works, and it's just like have enough, have enough uh, confidence to keep pushing forward and know you're going to hit it at some point in time. You know? Do you do you? You've met a lot of people, obviously, over the last a lot of a lot of different people over the last two decades in the space. Do you, in your opinion, do do enough people look at themselves and ask what they really want and what they're actually good at, or do you think a, a, the 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 mass majority just locks in and sticks with something, whether or not it's what they they in reality should be doing? I think most people are not self reflective. Just period, not in this space, just in the world, right? Like, uh, I think a lot, one thing that makes a lot of the great people great is, you know, they can be honest at what they're good at and what they're bad at and self-reflect and go through a process and go, hmm, what could I have done better? What could I have done different? Rather than, oh, I screwed up, right? Yeah. And like, so, you know, going, going through that process. But I think most people get into the space as they meet a guy or a girl who's making money. And they just start doing that thing, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, that was me, right? I was on this forum. There were these people making money. They told me what they did. I didn't think about what I'm good at or, like, any of that, right? And I think that's as you further along and mature in your journey. I mean, I was 29 when I started in the business. Uh, I'm 49 now. Um, so it's... You know, I'm a lot more self-reflective. I'm also a lot more beat up, right? <laughs> I've had a lot of failures over the years, you know, stuff I've tried or things I've built or stuff I've dumped money into. But that's also the what keeps me interested and in, in enjoyable in the space. You know? uh, but I don't, I don't think most people think about that at all. I don't think, the, I don't think most people think about self-reflection. Yeah. For the most part, I think one of the most powerful things people can do is get a journal and ask themselves an open-ended question every night. Like, what do I want my life to look like in five years? If I had this thing, what, what would it do for me? If I was like, or what sucked about today? What could I have done better today? You know, and journal that stuff and, you know, get into a habit. I don't journal anymore, but I'm very much always in a habit of self-reflection. And I, I really think that's just one of the most powerful patterns and traits that somebody can have. And, and a lot of us that have been around and do this thing for a long time, that are pretty good at it, we all do this inherently, but I think most of us don't understand that that's what we're even doing. What are you proudest about having accomplished over the last 20 years? I get really happy when I see people that have come through working with me or interacting with me being successful in this space or other spaces, right? It makes me proud because like my whole thing is I want to help people. I want to make people successful. If I make enough to other people be successful, um, you know, I believe like it'll come back to me in one way or another, right? And teaching, uh, what do they say? Like the learning process, the ultimate is like teaching, right? And so teaching people some stuff, like that also makes you better at it, right? And then you have people to... So, you know, when I when I call a company, big company that does a billion dollars a year and the CMO was an affiliate of ours <laughs> or I had this the other day, I got on with an agency, uh, Ralph Burns from Tier 11. He runs the Perpetual po uh, Traffic Podcast. He owns Tier 11 Agency. He's like, dude, I started with you as a dating affiliate. I've been listening to this guy's podcast for like five years. It's the best <laughs> podcast in the space, in my opinion, uh, talking about marketing strategies and tactics, all DR. And I've been listening to this guy, and I was like, oh, we need to do some Google stuff. Like, why don't we try using them? Get on the phone. He's like, oh, no, you don't remember me, but like, here's his journey. And the reason I own Tier 11 and the reason, uh, you know, I have this podcast is because I, you helped me as an affiliate starting out in dating, right? And I, That's so cool. That shit just warms my heart, right? The money is great and whatever, but, like, that stuff is so much more impactful to me. Feels um, And rewarding, you know? And, and 
you know, it sucks when you lose an employee and they were a great employee and you did something on your part that you could have done better to retain them. Um, and, but you see them be successful, right? And you're like, they came through a for the doors. So right? it feels like, good. Yeah, it makes me proud of like people that, you know, engage with us. That, that's probably the biggest thing for me uh, that I'm proud of. What are some things you'd like to accomplish in the next 10 to 20 years? I don't know. I don't, I'm not like a big goal setter. You know, I think, you know, you watch a lot of the personal development. That doesn't mean I don't set any goals. Like I, I'm, I'm setting constant goals with myself, but I, it's like, I've done a lot of things. I don't, I'm not like I have a big dream, right? But I oftentimes, you know, go through life and meet some people and they're doing a thing and that creates an opportunity and you wind up down a path that you never thought you would wind down. Yeah. Right. Uh, I'm involved with a yacht company building super yachts over in Croatia. And, you know, like I never would have like wrote down like this is what I want to do. And, you know, but I, I met a guy that was 27 years old and six generations of building yachts. And he's like, hey, I've got a dream to build a thing. Can you you're a business guy. Can you help me, you know, come up with concepts on how to structure stuff? Uh, and. I was like, yeah, I'll help you. And, you know, I never would have predicted that. So I guess all that to say, like, I try and be in the rooms with the people that are the smart people and, you know, make connections and build stuff and create opportunities. But I, not, nothing, you know, watch my kids grow up, <laughs> ski, yeah, you know, travel, see things, spend time with my friends. Like, that's... Really, what matters to, me, to you? What matters? Um, Are your kids curious about the industry? A little bit, you know. They're they're thirteen and fourteen, so you know the oldest one's interested in girls, and youngest one plays baseball, and so I mean they're not. I mean we've talked about it a lot. That's one thing fun I do with my kids is like. You know, they like video games, so any any parents out there, uh, they're always asking me for to buy things in the video games. So they probably read 30 personal development and business books since they've been eight years old. That's cool. Um, everything from like cash flow quadrant to how to win friends and influence people. Yeah. And then, you know, I've read all those as well. And... Then they'll come in and we'll talk about each chapter. Or I'll have them write a paper. Uh, there's something out there called Code Academy. It's oh, like yeah. you build this. you build video games, writing JavaScript and Python, and they like games. So it was like I would pay them when they were young. They were like eight. I'd pay them ten cents for each level they passed. <laughs> right. Cool. So they they kind of knew how to write code as young as eight years old. That's you know, wild. Trying to get something else, but learning this as a byproduct. Um, so they're not like, oh, what do you want to do? I want to do it and make money. You know, I think that is, they have a lifestyle that doesn't make them as hungry as, you know, they should be. They don't have to pay for stuff yet, right? It's 14. Yeah. Um, I could probably do better at, you know, I don't spoil them, spoil them, but like I could probably do better at, you know, making them earn stuff internal to the uh, but it's like you pick your battles you know I'd rather spend time having them learn you know personal development self reflection and the bigger things I think are really going to make a difference in their life uh, down the road you've had a lot of that yourself you worked with Tony Robbins at one point yeah I, I was a, a sales rep basically traveled would go into businesses talk for an hour and sell tickets um, kind of like delivering Tony Robbins' basic method and methodologies and mindset stuff. And I'm a, I am a big believer in that. I'm not a, you know, there, you got your cultist guru. Evangelist. Evangelist type. <laughs> That's not me. But like, I do believe in like his methodologies. 
like Tony's, you know, is all based on NLP. NLP says we're we're basically biologic computers running programs. Yep. And you know, you don't even realize the programs that you're running most of the time. I used to do this thing where I take somebody's hand and put it like this and um, well, you do this. Take your hands like this, put them together. What thumbs on top? Left. Left, right? Now take them to part, put them back together with the right thumb on top. How's that feel? Awkward. Yeah. It's weird, yeah. right? Is it better or worse? Why did you have to uh, Uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable, right? It's just always the way you've done it. You probably never have thought about it in your entire life. And that's the program that you're running in your head every day. And, and you, you don't think about these things. Another one is like, you put your pants on. I always put my left leg on first. What do you? Left, left leg. I left think, leg yeah. first, right? Every, it's like 50-50. Yeah. But again, something you've never thought about. And tomorrow morning, you're going to wake up. You're going to put your pants on and you're going to go, let me try and put my huh. right leg on. <laughs> and the question over. is, I mean, these are, these are really clear things that you can understand. But what other programs are you running inside of your head every single day that are actually counterintuitive, right? Like when we're kids, they say, don't talk to strangers. And then they say, go do sales, which is all about talk to strangers. But you're running this program in your head. And how do you become consciously aware of that and then move through the process of like unconscious incompetence to uh conscious incompetence to conscious competence to unconscious competence, right? How do you run run through that when you've got this brainwashing that you've had from whatever was in yep. your childhood, in your childhood or could have been through work, right? Like, yep. oh, I ran, I ran CBO one time and I lost a bunch of money. So CBO is bad, right? Like, no, it's not. Yeah. Like it was, it didn't work for that specific use case in that day. Right. And by the way, the algorithms change all the time. So it actually might be the best thing to do next week. And you're just choosing not to do it. And you, you've created a belief, like a deep seated belief that you're going to die on that hill. And I think, you know, back to the self-reflection and, and open mindedness is like, I can always only give you the, the best answers based on the knowledge that I have right now. Right. I, no more, no less. I, uh, I think of, um, I think of that as, have you ever hiked a mountain, like a big mountain? Yeah. There's this thing called false peaks. And they're like shelves, basically, in the mountain. And when you're on this, on this mountain, you look up, that looks like the top of the mountain. Right? And you hike, hike up, crest over that peak, and you're like, damn it, there's a whole other mountain here. Well, that must be the top, right? And you continually go through this process and much the same in life and business right like all you can do is see know what you can see right now from the peak that you can see right now but there's all kinds of people in this room that are much higher points on the mountain and they'll just look down and go yeah they think they know the things but there's all these false peaks on the way up and they, they don't see all this stuff right these and they see somebody running really hard, and you know that that's going to be a problem here. As soon as you get over this peak, you're going to realize you're going to run into a dead end. And so I, th- I think that stuff's important, right? To go into every conversation going, I don't know. Yeah. I only know what I know up until now. That's only a small fraction of what's available. And in, in, I find in this world, it's not always easy to have those conversations. A lot of people don't want don't want to admit they're wrong I think it's humans in general right? people in general yeah it's not but especially you, you think you think it's different in here no I think it's the same everywhere yeah right people have egos or you know it's defensiveness or they you know some people that show up and they tell me how great they are I'm like yeah I'm gonna I'm guessing if I poke in just a little bit there's like a soft candy center in there <laughs> you know you should show up and try and then those people, you start asking them two or three or four levels of questions into that. They get shaky. They don't want to answer anymore. It's like, just say you don't know, dude. <laughs> it's yeah. okay. Right? Like, there's all kinds of things I don't know. But you know, just so much of that is like upbringing and, you know. How? You travel a lot. How many countries have you been to? 
No idea. Probably, I'd guess 30, 30, 40. How has traveling impacted not just your life, but also your business? I think the more that you can walk into any room, confidence is an interesting thing just in general, right? Um, I think the more difficult situations you put yourself in, the harder things you can do, right? The bigger businesses you can build, right? You build a small one, you fail at it, you succeed at it. Maybe you fail at 10 of them and then you succeed at one. And you do that self-reflection process and those learnings. And that builds more and more confidence over time to do bigger and bigger things, take bigger and bigger risks. And I think the same is true with travel. Like, show up in a country. I, the, the most difficult country for me ever was Beijing. I flew into Beijing. And, you know, for the most part, up until then, I'd flown all to countries that had uh, Latin-based lang languages. Yeah. So, like, I'd... I could be like, oh, here's where you, we're going to go. They'd understand the letters. And, like, I landed in Beijing, and I'd get in a taxi, and I'd try to talk to the guy. He's got no idea what I've said. Nobody speaks English in Beijing at all. <gasps> and I'm like, oh, shoot. I got to get to the hotel. <laughs> How am I going to make this happen, right? And it's just like, hmm. You know, and depending on who you are, how do you handle that situation in that moment? Like, do you call home and say, I don't know what to do? Right, and for me, I'm like, hmm. So I just like instantly put on my problem solving hat. And I'm like, does my phone, can I put it in Chinese language? Yeah, I can. So then I figured out, like I'd search for the hotel in English, then I'd go in and I'd change the language to Chinese and I, and I could show him it and it would be in Chinese. Be, oh, okay, yeah, I get yeah. it. But I think every time you go through, like you're in a foreign country, nobody speaks the language, you have no, you've never been there before. You don't know how to get to the point, the guy anywhere. Like, and you, the more you deal with those situations in life, the more you can deal with those situations, I guess. Right. And that's every day in business sometimes. Yeah. You just, I, I, you know, I, my goal is always to feel like I could show up to any conversation in any room and provide value and feel like I belong there. Right. And I think the, the more, you know, travel is some of that, right? Seeing different parts of the world and understanding how different cultures view the world or different religions view the world. Yeah. Like, I've always been very curious about all that kind of stuff, right? Um, you know, when it comes to religion, is it, you know, the Buddhists are right or the Catholics are right? Like, I've done a lot of studying of all the different religions and, you know, I'm, Maybe they're all right. Maybe none of them are right. Yeah. But just like understanding the culture and why do people think those things. Perspective. Gives you so much more perspective, yeah. right? Now, you can always tell somebody that hasn't left the country and is very nationalistic versus, I mean, when, you know, in America as a country, I, I, I believe they want everybody to believe that we're the best place in the world and the rest of the world sucks. And the rest of the world's amazing. Right, like I agree. In food in Europe and culture in Europe and architecture Japan. and the story. Oh, in Tokyo, <laughs> I just I missed you there. Like in December, yeah, yeah. we almost crossed paths. Yeah. Like uh, I'm just, I'm just like these places are amazing, and there's so many things to learn from them and experiences to be had that you just can't get here. And you know, so I think you know people that are international. They're just more open-minded as a whole, right? That's why I like the the Philly World shows. Yeah, so you get you get to meet some super interesting people, super, right? You're, you're like, oh, all the Indians are scammers, and then like you go to Affiliate World, and you talk to like amazing media buyers that are doing better than the people I'm working with in the U.S. Yeah. Right? And but it's you know, it, it, it's a natural tendency if you're like. I've never met any Indians from India, right? And, and the only ones I've ever dealt with, the four of them sent me a bunch of fraud. Yeah. So they're fraudsters, right? And then that narrative gets created. You create right? the story. Yeah. By the way, does that mean there's no fraudsters? No, there's tons of fraudsters, but there's also great people in there as well, yeah. right? Uh, I think Nigeria, you know, 
Nigeria and Africa is like progressing a lot on the digital side. Like they, it's probably the most pro, uh, digitally progressive area of Africa. Have you been? Like I, I haven't been. I was in uh, Kenya uh, last year. But, you know, Nigeria is known for, like, scams, right? Like, hey, we got money Thank, for you, right? scams, yeah. So <laughs> anybody in America, for the most part, that hasn't been to Africa or maybe isn't more international, they're like, oh, all Nigerians are scammers, right? But that's not real. Yeah. And I think that traveling around the world gives you that different perspective for that. Have you lived outside the U.S. before? Never have, no. Um... I've lived in Miami, New York, Hartford, Connecticut a little bit, Denver a little bit, San Diego and Bay Area. You've seen the stretches of the extremes within the U.S. But within the U.S. Yeah. Yeah. It gets interesting. When, like, like, I moved to Colombia in August, and it's you, you almost forget what's happened in the U.S. And it gives you this, it, it reminds you of the perspective of the U.S. is not the center of the world. It's, yeah. it's great. It's a great option, right? Yeah, yeah. But it's just, it's very, it's very refreshing for at least for some time to just see it and hear it from a different lens, you know? Yeah. It's always, one of the things that's weird to me is like, I'll go to Europe and then like everything's going on in Europe and you're like there in the moment, part of that. And then you go home and almost to me, it's like, that's not happening anymore, but it's all still happening, right? right? Like you're not experiencing it. It's almost like you think it's not happening, but like, but it is. It's just <laughs> magnified and amplified when you're in it. When you're physically. in it, Yeah. And that's all the world, right? Like, yeah. so much happening in Thailand. There's so much happening in and we Japan. we don't, don't even know about or think yeah, about. Yeah. Like, it's so interesting. And it, it also, a lot of times, gives you different perspectives. Again, we're the U.S., myopic, nationalistic. But then you go see an amazing product in Tokyo, and you're like, why don't we have this here, right? <laughs> like, it gives you, you know, uh, you just see different things and consume them. It makes you more open-minded and... It just makes you realize you know less than you even thought you did. Which is so cool. <laughs> the little that you thought you did, you know even less than that. <laughs> Jason, what what hope or and advice do you have for the industry as a whole? Going forward into this next phase, TCPA, all the complications, the challenges. It's not really a hope, but to me, this industry, at least the doers in it, it breeds great people, and I think they'll they'll always find a way. You know, the S new SEC one-to-one ruling stuff. You know, like I said, when I started, there was no canned spam. When canned spam came, it was like, nobody can email anymore, right? <laughs> You're like, no, it doesn't work like that. Um, we can, we, you know, and then the industry figures it out. And I think the... The people that are like the core of this industry are really resourceful people. Um, you know, I I'm, have a constant hope that people will try and do things more compliantly. You know, in marketing and everything is inherently in the gray, right? Like, and it's just like, is it in the black or is it like totally in the white branded yeah. campaign? But even that sometimes has problems, right? Yeah. Like, and and I think. You know where that where that line is and the bulk of what's going on in the industry. I do feel like we've made some progress. You know, more towards the lighter gray. But then every once in a while, something comes around like ACA, and it it goes heavy black into the back into the black. Yeah. Right. Like, um, and I think that's the inherent opportunity seeker nature of the business, and. You know, a lot of the younger generation, you know, the 20-somethings that... I, I remember when I started in this business, you know, like, I didn't, I didn't never talk to an... I didn't have any money to talk to an attorney. I was just trying to figure out how to make a dollar, right? And, you know, as you as you progress and learn more stuff, you, you get legal advice and start to understand where those rules are. And um, so, you know, my my hope is always... People come through that or whatever that is and figure out how to build bigger and better things compliantly, you know, whether it's for this industry or other industries. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I said it on stage many years ago. I think this business creates the best marketers in the world. You, ha you have to be good. Yeah. Like, there's no room to just 
throw up ads and cross we, we do that but yeah it's not sustainable right yeah what's is there a quote or idea that you live by that you want to share uh, that I'm a you? huge fan of Jim Rohn Jim Rohn was Tony Robbins mentor and he said work harder than yourself on yourself than you do in your job and then that pairs with another quote of his it says you're rewarded by the value you bring to the marketplace. So the more you self-reflect, the more you learn, the harder challenges you take on, the bigger things you build, the more value you bring to the marketplace and inherently should be able to create businesses that make more money or partner with better people or whatever that is. So I really take that to heart. I think a lot of people that get into this business do it to chase money and the money will come and the money will go but the skill sets that you gain and who you become through the process of the journey and how you self reflect on that and how you grow is is really kind of my core operating principle it's awesome yep how can people connect with you um, I'm on Instagram, Jason Active, and Facebook, and Twitter, and all the things. Uh, you always know, just email me at jasona at a4d.com, um, Skype. I'm, I love to talk to people. I love smart people. I love, uh, I love it when somebody's like, I figured this thing out, but I don't know how to scale it. Like that's that's one of my favorite places to be. Yeah, because that's really what I focus on now is how do we take something that's working and rather than do a hundred thousand a month, do five million a month. Yeah. Mostly what I'm looking for and people to talk to. Awesome man. Well, thank you for your time, brother. All right. Appreciate you. Yeah. So good to see you, John. Always. See you guys next time.